Welcome to Through the Bible. I'm your host, Steve Schwetz, welcoming you as we continue our journey through God's entire Word. We'll begin in Esther chapter 1, verse 4 in just a minute. And while you grab your seat on the Bible bus and find your place in God's Word, let me share a couple of letters from our fellow passengers. These are in Indonesia. First, we hear from a listener of our Madurese language broadcast. This program has taught me to share God's Word in order to reach souls who have not known of His love. I want to proclaim the gospel so that many people can be saved. Please pray I might be effective and bear much fruit for the glory of our Lord. And then here's a letter. This is from a listener of our Javanese language broadcast. From this program, I know that the love of Jesus Christ is real in my life. I can feel it. Jesus was willing to die for me. As I continue to study, I'm finding the different writers of the gospels fascinating. Now that I know the background of each writer, I understand their viewpoint better. My favorite study has been the book of Mark. Through your words, I feel I know who Mark is, his characteristics, and much about his life. Thank you for helping me know the Bible better. And then our last letter is from a listener of our Sudanese broadcast. The Word of God on the Sudanese program led us to follow God. This has changed my life and the life of my family members. I used to believe in spirits and make offerings, but I do not do it anymore because God has set us free from these rituals. I believe God is faithful, and he will be with us till the end of the world. I praise him for saving my family. Well, this week, our world prayer team is traveling through Indonesia and South Asia. So if you'd like to join us as we praise God for the faith of these listeners, and then also to ask him to reach more people with the good news of his son, Jesus Christ, then you need to visit us at ttb.org forward slash pray. And let's do that now as we begin our study. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word that is reaching people in our neighborhoods and in more than 120 languages and dialects around the world. As we follow your hand in the book of Esther, would you help us to clearly see it in our own lives too? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now today we come back to the book of Esther, and we left off last time where this king... Ahasuerus, who is Xerxes, and if you do not mind, I'm going to call him Xerxes from now on. He has called a meeting of 127 provinces, that is, the rulers and leaders of all of his provinces that extend from India to Ethiopia. He was one of the rulers of the second great world kingdom that Daniel had mentioned, the Media Persian Empire. Now he's calling them together, apparently for the purpose of selling them on a program of going against Greece. And apparently it was a program that he needed to sell it, by the way, because I'm not sure they were too enthusiastic about it. Now I left off at verse 3, and we're told that verse 4, that when he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the honor of his excellent majesty many days, even a hundred and fourscore days. Now, this is quite remarkable. This is a program that lasted actually for six months. And that's a long time to have a program going on. It went a hundred and eighty days. The father of Louis XV of France was talking with the preceptor of the kingdom, and the father made the statement of Louis XV, said, how in the world could a man have patience enough to put on this kind of a program for six months? And the preceptor, he said, how in the world would he be able to pay for it? Well, that is something that apparently costs millions even in that day. Six months, he brings them together, and he attempts to sell them on this program 
of going against Greece. I'm sure that he displayed the fact that he was able to pay for the campaign. And it would always be nice when we go into a war, if we could just be sold before we go into it, whether we're going to be able to pay for it or not. Well, this king is selling it to his kingdom and is telling these rulers that he's able to pay for it. And he's also displaying the luxury and the opulence and the wealth of his kingdom. And it was a great pagan feast. It was a godless thing. And now we take a look at it, and there are those that try to find spiritual lessons here. Very candidly, I see none whatsoever. God's introducing us here into a pagan heathen court where decisions are made that affect the world. And it looks as if God is left out. But God wants you to know that he's overruling these circumstances and he's going to accomplish his own purpose. Now we're told in verse 5, when these days were fulfilled, the king made a feast unto all the people who were present in Shushan the palace, both unto great and small, seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace. Now here is a banquet that's going to last seven days where were white, green, and blue hangings fastened with cords of fine linen and purple to silver rings and pillars of marble. The couches were of gold and silver upon a pavement of red and blue and white and black marble. Now, here is the description given to us, and there are those that attempt to find spiritual lessons in this description. I candidly do not see that there's any here. All God is telling us is that in this tremendous display, a gaudy display of wealth, the silver, the gold, and all the jewels, and these beautiful hangings. Now, the ruins of those palaces are still over there. And a few years ago, they celebrated the 2500th anniversary of the Persian Empire. It's this empire we're talking about now. And there was a banquet made, and you remember all of the magazines and the TV news programs. They showed something of the tremendous display of wealth. It cost millions of dollars. And there was a great deal of criticism because in that land of poverty to have this display. Well, here's the first banquet, apparently, that was put on that we have any record of. And this banquet lasts seven days. And it was in that palace. They didn't have to build tents on the outside. These marble palaces with these gorgeous display of color in the draperies and the awnings and all of that. It must have been a feast for the eye to have seen it. And this king is selling these people on that. One of the automobile dealers here in California was telling me that many years ago, not too many, several years ago, that when the Chevrolet changed their model and they called all the dealers back to Detroit, and they had a week of selling them, and it culminated in a great banquet to sell this new car. Well, human nature doesn't change back here at the very beginning here in the media Persian Empire, and this was a great many think was about 486 B.C., why he's getting ready to make this campaign. Well, this is a great selling effort on his part. And we read in verse 7, "...and they gave them drink in vessels of gold, the vessels being different one from another, in royal wine in abundance, according to the bounty of the king." In other words, everything was there in abundance. And this was a great banquet. And the drinking was according to the law. None did compel. And, of course, they weren't as civilized as we are today. Some of these businessmen tell me that it's almost impossible to go to some business meetings today where they have a cocktail party and not participate. One man told me that he had an executive position. And the owner or the president of this tremendous concern called him in. Noticed at one of their social gatherings that he didn't drink. And of all things, I would think today that a president of a corporation would want a sober man. And he rebuked him because he hadn't participated in 
drinking the cocktails. But you see, we're civilized today, and we force them. Back there, they didn't force them at all. None did compel. For so the king had appointed to all the officers of his house that they should do according to every man's pleasure. Also, Vashti the queen made a feast for the women in the royal house, which belonged to King Ahasuerus. Now, Vashti, she made a banquet for the women. You see, the men and the women didn't have a banquet together in that day. That was a breach of social custom to have done that. Again, my, they are uncivilized, aren't they, not to have it all together and to have a display of sex in some manner or other. But they really didn't. This is serious business not selling an automobile, but it's selling a war, a campaign against Greece. And so here Vashti has a meeting of the women's auxiliary. They meet in a separate palace, the palace of Vashti, and she's entertaining the women at this banquet. Now, notice what happens, though. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, and that means he got drunk, this king overstepped himself. You didn't have to drink, but if you wanted to, you could have all you want. And the king apparently was not a teetotaler by any means, and he got drunk. Now, he did something that he would never have done had he been sober. He commanded Mehuman, Bizta, Harbona, Bigtha, and Abagtha, Zether, and Carcass, the seven chamberlains who served in the presence of Ahasuerus, the king, now, this was quite an exercise in pronunciation here, but these men were the men who did the bidding of the king. And in his drunken condition, he commands them to go and bring Vashti the queen before the king with the crown royal to show the people and the princess her beauty, for she was fair to look on. You see now what he's doing here is a thing that's very ungentlemanly. It was positively crude. He never would have done it had he been sober. And he sends them to bring her. And apparently the reason that he's doing it, he displayed his glory and his riches. And now he wanted them to see the glory of Vashti, his treasure, his jewel, as it were. Well, instead of displaying that, why, we find here that he reveals a family scandal. Notice what happens. But the queen, Vashti, refused to come at the king's commandment by his chamberlains. Therefore, was the king enraged, and his anger burned in him. I think the king got up when he had sent these chamberlains. He said, now I've got a real surprise for you. I want you to see my queen, and she'll be brought in with a crown royal upon her. And she must have been a beauty. But when the order came over for her to come, she refused. And don't tell me women didn't have rights in that day because this woman could turn this down. She certainly wasn't forced to come. Now, the king is drunk, and this makes him angry. To begin with, he's embarrassed. Imagine having one of these chamberlains come up and whisper in his ear. And the king says, well, where is the queen? And the chamberlain says, she won't come. She says, she's not coming. And now the king's embarrassed. He's got to offer some explanation to the guests that are there, and apparently several thousand at this banquet. Then the king said to the wise men who knew the times, for so was the king's manner toward all that knew law and judgment. And the next unto him was Karshina, Shether, Admetha, Tarshish, Merez, Messina, Memukin, the seven princes of Persia, and media who saw the king's face and who sat at the first in the kingdom. In other words, these men were his cabinet. They were the ones that met with him privately and personally, just like the cabinet meets with the president of the United States. And there are a great many others out in the different departments probably never see the president. Well, these men did. Now he calls a meeting of his cabinet because this really is very serious may sound silly to us today. Here's a queen won't come. Why not forget it and go on to something else, have some entertainment at the banquet, which I'm sure he did. But believe me, he calls a meeting of the cabinet, these men, 
for their advice. What are you going to do in an embarrassing moment like this? Well, the question was, verse 15, What shall we do unto the queen, Vashti, according to law? Because she hath not performed the commandment of the king, Ahasuerus, by the chamberlains. And apparently, friend, there was no law that they could exercise. We hear today a great deal about the fact that back in those days, women were chattels. And it is true that in many cases that was so. But apparently this woman had a great deal of freedom, and there's no law that could force her to come. So they're going to have to come up with a very severe and harsh law. And here it is, and this man Mamukan speaks. He's the spokesman here. And let me read verse 16. And Mimucan answered before the king and the princess, Vashti the queen hath not done wrong to the king only, but also to all the princes, to all the people who are in the provinces of the king Ahasuerus. Now, I want to introduce this little fellow to you. Mimucan is a henpecked husband. He's really henpecked. And he's disturbed by this, because if the queen gets by with this, this little fellow wouldn't want to go home. He's a Mr. Milk Toast, and I don't think he had very much to say in his own home. I think his wife made most of the decisions. I think that's one of the reasons that he speaks out here. There are many men today that where they work, they take orders from others. They never express themselves. And when they're at home, they... Wife won't let them express themselves. And that's the reason that they speak when they're on a church board. That's the reason you have to listen to some language sometimes that makes no contribution to the welfare or any development of the kingdom of God here on earth because of the fact that they're just talking and generally make suggestions that are not good to begin with. Well, Mamukan is a little henpecked husband, and he's going to speak now because this is his chance. He's one of the princes of the kingdom, and he's this kind of a man. I heard the story about the man. He was also a Mr. Milktoes, a little henpecked fellow. He came into his office one day where he worked, and he went around to the different people he worked with. He said, you know, my wife says I'm a model husband. And finally he came to a hard-boiled secretary and said to her, you know, my wife says I'm a model husband. And everybody else was commanding him. And this hard-boiled secretary, she didn't command him, says, why don't you look that up in the dictionary? And you won't be so proud of it. He looked it up in the dictionary. And he found out what a model husband was. A model, he found out, is a small imitation of the real thing. <laughs> and that's what Mimucan is. He's a small imitation of the real thing. Now listen to what he says. Verse 17. For this deed of the queen shall come to the attention of all women, so that they shall look with contempt upon their husbands when it shall be reported. The king Ahasuerus commanded Vashti the queen to be brought in before him, but she came not. Likewise shall all the ladies of Persia and Media say this day unto all the king's princes, and he's one of them, you see, who hath heard of the deed of the queen. Thus shall there arise too much contempt and wrath. He said, I'll have a fight when I go home. In fact, the matter is, I think he'd come to the conclusion that if something wasn't done, he wasn't going home. Now listen to verse 19. If it please the king, let there go a royal commandment from him, and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes, that it may not be altered, that Vashti come no more before King Ahasuerus, and let the king give her royal estate unto another who is better than she. Well, this is extreme. But notice the reaction of the king and the others. When the king's decree, which he shall make, shall be published throughout all his empire, for it's great, all the wives shall give to their husbands honor, both to great and to small. And the saying pleased the king and the princes. And the king did according to the word of Mamukan. For he sent letters into all the king's provinces, into every province, according to its writing, and to every people after their language, that every man should bear rule in his own house, and that it should be published according to the language of every people. Now, the decree was this. First of all, the queen is set aside. She's no more to be queen. 
And the reason given is because she's refused to obey the king. Therefore, a decree has gone out. And that decree is that in the kingdom that a wife is to honor her husband and the man is to rule. And apparently this hadn't been true before in the media Persian Empire, but now it's to be true and it becomes the law of the Medes and Persians and it cannot be altered or changed. Now we come to chapter 2. And I've labeled chapter 2 the first beauty contest. And here we have it. And in chapter 2, verse 1, after these things, after what things? Well, the things that have taken place in chapter 1, plus the fact that this campaign was carried on. Apparently, Xerxes couldn't get the queen to do what he wanted him to, but he got all the princes in the kingdom to join with him now in a great campaign against Greece. Now we have to turn to secular history to fill this in because there's no record here. It just says after these things. Well, here's some of the things. This man, Xerxes, led a great army and he crossed over into Europe. And he met the Greeks at Thermopylae. And that was unfortunate because the secret of the strength of the Persians was in numbers. The individual soldiers were not so much. They were not well-trained as the Greeks were. And the Greek had emphasized the person, the individual. And as a result, one Greek soldier could have taken care of ten Persians. And so at the Battle of Thermopylae, only a few could get in the pass. And as a result, the Greeks got a signal victory over the Persians. It's not unfortunate from my viewpoint, but it was unfortunate for Xerxes that he carried on the battle at the place where he was doomed to lose. God had already said the power was to pass from Persia to Greece. And if you want to know whether God intervened or not, this man Xerxes had 300 ships that had gone around to come in from the rear to attack, and they were in the bay at Salamis. And it just looked as if the next day, why, they would land and the attack would be from the rear, and they'd win that. But during the night, a storm came up, and it sank all 300 of the Persian ships. None were left. And all of the manpower they had was destroyed, was drowned. So that this man Xerxes now, he's been defeated, very much defeated. And so this man, in that condition, comes back to his palace here at Shushan. He walks up and down after these things. When the wrath of King Ahasuerus was appeased, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what was decreed against her. Now, the law of the Medes and Persians can't be changed. Even the law that this king made, he himself cannot alter it nor change it. In that drunkard stupor, he had set aside this beautiful queen, And now he can never again have her. And after his defeat, in his loneliness, he walks up and down the palace. And he's moody. And not only that, this man had a mental aberration, as we shall see. And he's thinking of Ashtai. And the servants there know it. And they are watching him. And they know something now must be done. Then said the king's servants that ministered unto him, Let there be fair young virgins sought for the king. Let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom, that they may gather together all the fair young virgins under Shushan the palace, to the house of the women, under the custody of Hegai, the king's chamberlain, keeper of the women, and let their beautifying ointments be given them. In other words, these servants suggest a beauty contest. And now, who's going to win it? Well, I'm going to have to stop here today. This is a good place to stop in a continued story because I'm afraid some of you won't be able to sleep until we find out who's going to win this contest. It's hard to see how God is going to bring some good out of all this madness. 
But join us tomorrow as the saga of King Xerxes continues here on Through the Bible. In the meantime, if you'd like to invite a friend to join us for the study in Esther, they can find everything they need to get started at ttb.org forward slash Esther. And don't forget to remind them to download their copy of Briefing the Bible, which contains Dr. McGee's notes and outlines of our study of Esther. Briefing the Bible is available at ttb.org forward slash Briefing the Bible, where you can download the electronic version or request a print copy. But please note, the paperback version is abridged, and it doesn't contain Dr. McGee's full notes on every book of the Bible. Now, tomorrow, as we continue our journey through Esther chapter 2, we'll hear about one of the world's first recorded beauty contests, and the outcome will change the course of history. I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'll be here saving a seat on the Bible bus just for you. We're grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners who are being used by God to take the whole word to the whole world.